Hello everyone and welcome to the coronavirus edition of the seventh exercise from our signal theory class. In this exercise we will first practice the damping ratio and then we will move on to the non-homogeneous systems. So first the damping ratio. Here I give you this differential equation and my question is what kind of damping does this system have? To figure this out, I need to take this differential equation and divide it by this coefficient with the second derivative. So I need to divide this differential equation by 3. When I do that, I get this. And from here, I can read that my natural frequency squared is 3 and 2 zeta omega naught is 4. So from this I can get that my natural frequency is square root of 3 and then from this I can get that 2 zeta omega naught is this and this is I got when for omega naught I substituted square root of 3 and this is supposed to be equal to this 4, this 4. And from here I can get that zeta is 4 divided by 2 times square root of 3, which is approximately 1.15, which is greater than 1, and that means that this system is overdamped. So I can expect its response to be slowly stabilizing. Now let's take a look at this differential equation. It's a different differential equation, but the question is the same. What kind of damping does my system have? Well, here this coefficient is already 1, so I do not have to divide by anything. And I can directly read that my natural frequency squared is 4. And from there I can say that my natural frequency is 2. And here I can read that my 2 zeta omega naught is 4. So I can write that 2 zeta omega naught is this. Here I have substituted for omega naught from here. And this is supposed to be equal to 4 this 4. And from there I can read that my zeta is 1. That means that my system is critically damped. Its response will be quickly stabilizing but it will not go into oscillations. Now this differential equation. Here I need to divide by 2 which will give me this differential equation. And here I can read that my omega naught squared is 2 and 2 zeta omega naught is 2. From there my natural frequency is square root of 2 and 2 zeta omega naught when I substitute for omega naught is 2 zeta square root of 2 and that is supposed to be equal to 2, this 2. And from here I can read that zeta is 1 over square root which is less than 1 and that means that the system is underdamped. That means that its response will have these oscillations. It will be stable, the system will stabilize, but it will do it in this oscillatory manner. Now the last case, this equation. Here I can see that my natural frequency squared is 2. It's kind of difficult to see what is zeta because I am missing the first derivative. I'm missing the first derivative because it is being multiplied by zero. The coefficient in front of the first derivative is zero and that means that 2 zeta omega naught is equal to zero. And from there I can say that zeta is zero. And that means that I have undamped case. So in this case my system will respond with oscillations that will not be damped and the system will oscillate indefinitely. So this is how you can judge the damping in your system and the type of response the system will give you based on the coefficients of the differential equation and by using the damping ratio. Here you have the damping issue from a different perspective. This differential equation can describe the movement of some weight on a spring. That m is the mass of that weight and k is the stiffness of the spring. This c is a coefficient of resistance. Increasing this c increases the damping in the system and decreasing this c decreases the damping in the system. Now you do not have any control over mass, that is set to be 5, and you do not have any control over k, that is set to be 2. But you do have control, in fact you are supposed to suggest the value of c so that this system has a critical response. How do you do that? Here I have two ways 
how you can approach this problem. This first approach uses the roots of the characteristic equation. So here I have my differential equation and here I have substituted for mass and for the stiffness of the spring. This is my characteristic equation and this is the discriminant of my characteristic equation. If I want my system to be critically damped, I need my discriminant to be equal to zero. So I need to set this to be equal to zero. And from here I can crunch, 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 and I will get that the value of my C, my coefficient of resistance needs to be square root over 40. So this is the amount of damping I need to introduce into my system so that I get critically damped response. Now the second approach. Here again I have my differential equation and I have substituted for the mass and for the stiffness of the spring. Now using the damping ratio, this I can denote as natural frequency squared and this I can denote as 2 times the damping ratio times the natural frequency. And from here I can read that my natural frequency is square root of 2 over 5 and that 2 times zeta omega naught is c over 5, c over 5. Now if I want that critically damped response, zeta needs to be equal to 1. In addition, I substitute that omega is this, and when I substitute this here and take 1 for this, I will get this, and this is equal c over 5. When I crunch this, I will again get that C, the coefficient of resistance, needs to be square root over 40. So this much damping, this much resistance I need to introduce into my system to get that critically damped response. Let's take a look at those non-homogeneous systems. This is the circuit which I had during the lecture. This circuit is described with this differential equation. As during the lecture, at first I will assume that the input voltage is this constant uppercase V sub 1. Except now I will add that I will have this initial condition. At time 0 I will assume that the output voltage is 0. That means that this capacitor at time zero is not charged. And my question is, what is the output voltage? That is, what is the voltage on this capacitor? Now, I can solve this in these four steps. Step number one is to find the particular solution, one way how this circuit can behave. That we have done during the lecture, where I showed you that one particular solution can be that the output voltage is equal to the input voltage. Step number two is to find the general solution of the associated homogeneous differential equation. That means that I will take my non-homogeneous differential equation and for those input sources I will substitute zero. That will give me this homogeneous equation. This homogeneous differential equation has this characteristic equation which has this root and that gives me this general solution. Step number three, I need to construct the general solution of the non-homogeneous differential equation. That I will construct as the sum of the particular solution, that is this, and the general solution of the associated homogeneous differential equation, that is this. When I substitute, I get this. This is my general solution. This gives me all the ways how my circuit can behave. Now I need to find this constant so that I will fit this general solution to my initial condition. How do I do that? Well, I will take this general solution and I will substitute this time 0 and I will get this. From here, I will get that my constant A is minus V sub 1. I will take this constant, substitute it into the general solution and I will get this solution. This solution describes how my circuit, how my output voltage is going to behave for this initial condition. I have plotted that here and I have made this plot for the input voltage equal to 1 volt and for the product of the resistance and capacitance equal to 0.1. The unit here turns out to be a second. And you can see that the voltage really starts at zero and then it exponentially rises to one volt.
And that is actually what's going on in this circuit. You can see that at time zero, this capacitor is not charged. And then it starts to charge through this resistor and its voltage is going to exponentially rise so that at the end it will asymptotically approach the input voltage. Another example. Here I have the same circuit, the same differential equation and the same initial condition. But this time the input voltage is this sign. This voltage is going to be a pure tone in this form. And my question still is what is the output voltage? What is this voltage? Okay, to solve this I first need to find the particular solution. If my input is this sign, I can break it into these two complex exponentials. I'm doing this because it is easy to find out how these complex exponentials are transferred through the system. If I put a complex exponential at the input of my system, because this complex exponential is the eigenfunction of this differential equation, the output will be the same complex exponential except multiplied by a complex number. How do I find this complex number? Well, I will need to take this input, put it into my differential equation, and I will need to take this output and also put it into my differential equation. Here I have done those substitutions. I need to take derivative that will give me this. Here I can cancel out the exponentials and that will give me this. From here I can write that this h is 1 over 1 plus j omega rc. And you can see that this is actually dependent on omega. So I can write that this is actually function of omega, h of omega. From the lecture we call this the frequency characteristic, which has some magnitude and some phase. So if this was the input of my system, the output of my system when I substitute would be this. If this is the input of my system, from the lecture I showed you that the output will be the same sign except multiplied by the magnitude of the frequency characteristic and phase shifted by the phase of the frequency characteristic. So when I compute the magnitude and phase of this frequency characteristic, I will get this. This is my particular solution. That is one output I can get for this input, but this output does not yet have to satisfy this initial condition. To get the solution that satisfies my initial condition, I need to continue with the step two. I need to find the general solution of the associated homogeneous equation. That is, I need to take my non-homogeneous equation, I need to set the input to zero, and that will give me this homogeneous, this associated homogeneous equation. The characteristic equation of this differential equation is this, the root is this, and the general solution is this. Now the step three, I need to write down the general solution of the non-homogeneous equation, which will be given as the particular solution, that is this, plus the general solution of the associated homogeneous equation, which is this. And here I have it substituted. This is the general solution. These are all the ways how my system can behave. Now I need to find this constant A, that will be step 4, I need to find this constant A so that I will fit my solution to this initial condition. To do that I will substitute this time 0 into my general solution and I will get this, which can be simplified into this. Here I can use the formula that the sine of arc tangent is this, which will allow me to simplify this, or at least rewrite this, into this, and this can be simplified into this. And this is, per this initial condition, supposed to be equal to zero. From here I can write that my constant A is this. This I will take and substitute it into my general solution and that will give me this solution. And this is the solution, this is the output of my circuit that will satisfy this initial condition. 
here I have plotted the output voltage. You can see that at time zero, my output voltage is zero. That means that at time zero, this capacitor is not charged. And then at time zero, I switch on the input. I bring this signal to the input and this will be the output of my system. And here you can recognize two parts of the output. At the beginning, the system, the circuit is getting used to the new input and we get this transient part of our response. And once the circuit kind of stabilizes to that new input, I will be left with this steady state response, which is this periodic response, where this sign is being transferred to another sign which is scaled in amplitude and shifted in phase. In this solution, you can see that this is the part which will ebb away. As this times goes to infinity, this exponential will asymptotically approach zero, this entire thing will asymptotically approach zero, and I will be left with this. This will create my steady state response. Now, it is not in general that the particular solution would give me the steady state response. But if your input is periodic and you compute your particular solution using the frequency characteristic, then your particular solution is going to give you your steady state response. Here I have yet another example. This time I have a different circuit. This will be my input voltage, this will be my initial condition, and I will be interested in what is the output voltage. To find the output voltage, I need to describe this circuit with a differential equation, and this time I will build it from ground up. To build the differential equation of this circuit, I need to express the relationship between the voltages and the currents in this circuit. So the relationship between the current flowing through this capacitor and the voltage on the capacitor is that the current is derivative of the voltage multiplied by the capacitance. That is what I have written here. V1 minus V2, V1 minus V2 is the voltage on the capacitor. I need to take derivative of that multiplied by the capacitance and that will give me the current, the current flowing through the capacitor. Now the current through the resistor, that will be the voltage on the resistor divided by the resistance. The voltage on the resistor divided by the resistance. Now I can substitute the second equation into the first one and that will give me this. When I rearrange the terms, I will get this differential equation. And you can see that this is the case where I have here a derivative of the input signal in the differential equation. Okay, let's solve this. Step number one, I need to find a particular solution. Because my input is a cosine, the output will be the same cosine, except multiplied by the magnitude of the frequency characteristic and phase shifted by the phase of the frequency characteristic. So I need to find my frequency characteristic. To find the frequency characteristic, I will feed my system this exponential, and because this exponential is the eigenfunction of this differential equation, the output will be the same exponential except multiplied by this complex number. So to find this complex number, I need to take this input, put it into my differential equation, I need to take this output, put it into my differential equation, and I get this. Here I need to take derivative, that will give me this. Here I need to cancel out these exponentials and that will give me this. From here I can get that this h is j omega rc divided by 1 plus j omega rc. And this is my frequency characteristic. So when I take the magnitude and phase of this frequency characteristic and I substitute it here and here, I will get this particular solution. This will be one output, one possible output of my circuit. Uh, I hope that nobody has a problem finding the magnitude of this frequency characteristic, but sometimes students do have a problem finding the phase of this frequency characteristic. So I have written that here in more detail. So the phase of the frequency characteristic will be the phase of this complex number, the phase of this complex number, and that will be the phase of the numerator, the phase of the numerator, minus the phase of the denominator the phase of the denominator. The phase of the numerator will be pi over 2. This is 
purely imaginary number for omega positive, its phase is pi over 2. This phase, the phase of this complex number, will be arctangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part, arctangent of omega rc. So this is the phase of my frequency characteristic and that comes here. Okay, step number two. I need to find the general solution of the associated homogeneous equation. So I need to go here, take a look at my non-homogeneous differential equation, and I need to substitute zero for the input. That will give me this homogeneous equation. This homogeneous differential equation has this uh, characteristic equation, and this characteristic equation has this root, and that will give me this general solution of this homogeneous differential equation. Step number three, I need to construct the general solution of the non-homogeneous differential equation, and that will be given by the particular solution, that is this, and the general solution of the associated homogeneous equation, which is this. When I substitute, I get this. Step number four, is to find this constant a so that this general solution will fit my initial condition. To do that, I will need to take this time zero, substitute it here and here, and that will give me this, which I can simplify into this, which, because of this initial condition, needs to be equal to zero. And from here, I can get that my constant A is this monstrosity. So when I take this constant A and I substitute it into the general solution, I will get this solution. This will be the solution that will satisfy this initial condition. It might seem to be a very long expression, but mostly it is just bloated constants. With some given omega R and C, this is just a constant, that is just a number. This is just a constant, that is just a number. And this whole thing is just a number, that is just a constant. So basically what you get is just a cosine with some amplitude phase plus this real exponential. This solution I have drawn here. This is drawn for omega equal to 2 pi times 10 and the product of rc equal to 0 0.1. And again, you can see that at the beginning of the solution, I have the transient, which ebbs away, and then I am left with that steady state response. In this solution, this part is that transient. It will ebb away because of this exponential. When this time rises, this exponential goes asymptotically to zero, and this whole thing will go away. This is what will be left behind and that will give me my steady state solution. And one additional piece of information. Because I went into trouble of computing the frequency characteristic, it would be worthwhile to take a look at the plot of it and examine what kind of filtering this circuit actually provides. This is the plot of the amplitude frequency characteristic computed for the product of the resistance and capacitance equal to 1. And from here you can see that this circuit actually acts as a high pass filter. Here I have yet another example. This time I'm using the same circuit as I used on the lecture. This circuit is described with this differential equation and I know that it has this frequency characteristic. But this time I will not feed the circuit just a constant or a sine or a cosine, but a more general periodic signal with period equal to 2. One period of that periodic signal is described here. For the first half of that period the signal is 1, for the second half of the period the signal is 0. So I'm feeding the circuit this square wave. This time I will not have any initial conditions, I will not have any initial point from which the circuit is switched on and then I follow what is going on at the output. I will assume that this circuit is operating from the time minus infinity, so I will be interested only in that steady state.
So how do I find the output voltage of the circuit for this input voltage of the circuit? Well, I need to break this input signal into exponentials. How do I do that? Well, I can write this input signal as this Fourier series, which is just a linear combination of these complex exponentials. The frequencies of these complex exponentials are these, which when I substitute for t, I get this. These complex amplitudes are the coefficients of the Fourier series, which are given by this formula. When I substitute for the period and for the frequency here, I will get this integral. And this integral goes from 0 to 2. It goes from 0 to 2 over 1 period. And here I need to realize that all I need to integrate is from 0 to 1, where the signal is 1. So I can rewrite this integral into this one. Here I have evaluated that integral and here I have substituted the limits. Here I can simplify it a little bit more by realizing that this is just minus 1 to the power of k. And I must not forget that this is valid only for k different from 0 because I'm dividing by this k. If k is equal to 0, then the coefficient, the respective coefficient of the Fourier series is equal to the average value of this signal, which without computation I can see from this plot is 0.5. So I can write that my input signal, my input voltage V1, is this one half, that is that 0 0.5, plus this sum, where I have substituted these coefficients here. And I got this. Now I have to realize that this is just a linear combination of complex exponentials. And when these complex exponentials are passed through my system, they are just multiplied by the frequency characteristic at the respective frequency. So when this complex exponential is being passed through the system, I will get at the output the same complex exponential that is being multiplied by the frequency characteristic at the respective frequency. This is the frequency of my complex exponential. Slightly tricky is this constant. You know how to solve this circuit for a constant, but I can save you some trouble here. You can actually realize that this constant is just a complex exponential at zero frequency. You can write this one half as one half times e to the j zero t. So this is just a complex exponential at zero frequency. So when it is passed through the system, then it will be multiplied by the frequency characteristic at zero frequency. Now, this is the expression for my output voltage. And when I substitute for the frequency characteristic from here, I will get this. So this will be the Fourier series of my output voltage. Now let's go into MATLAB and let's find out what this sum actually equals to. With MATLAB, I will start by copying this expression into my code. I will start with this part. Now I will continue with this part. And now I will continue with this exponential. And this I will need to add from k going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So I need to put this into loop and keep adding it. And I will be adding it into a variable v2, like this. To make this work, I need to define a bunch of variables that I used here. So I will do this for resistance that is equal, let's say, 10 kilo ohms. And I will do this for capacitance that is equal to 10 microfarads. 
Next, I will need to do this for some specific times and I will do this for times going for going from minus five with this small step all the way to five seconds. Although uh, for this to work for that initial addition, I need to assign some value to this V2 and the first value that will be added, I will set to zero. Last, I will need to set this uppercase K. Ideally, this lowercase K should go from minus infinity to plus infinity, but that would make this video rather long. So I will satisfy myself with adding from minus 100 to plus 100. So I will set my uppercase K to be 100. And the last thing I need to take care of is the fact that I cannot divide by zero here. This is valid for k is different from zero. When k is zero, I need to use this. So in this cycle, when k is zero, I need to skip this iteration and I need to continue with the next iteration. So for this, I will use this, the command continue like this. But if I skip k is equal to zero here, I will need to do it after that for cycle. Here I have added this constant. And this code will actually provide me with this sum with this expression for the Fourier series of my output voltage. So now that I have it, let's plot it. I will label the axis before I plot it. And here I go. This is what I get. This is what I get when I plot this. And this is my output voltage when I have this at the input of my circuit. And when I take a look at my circuit, it actually makes sense from the physical standpoint. When I am here, my input voltage is zero, this voltage is zero, and this capacitor will discharge itself through this resistor to some low voltage. Then when my voltage at the input jumps to one volt, this voltage jumps to one volt, this capacitor will start to charge itself through this resistor. And that is what I see here. This capacitor, this voltage will start at some very low value and then it will charge to the value of one volt, which is this voltage at the input. Then when this jump comes, the voltage at the input will drop from the value of one volt to zero volts this voltage will drop from one volt to zero volts. And when it does, whatever voltage is on this capacitor will start to discharge through this resistor to this input voltage. And that is what I see here. This is the initial voltage at the capacitor and then it will discharge to this voltage. And then the process repeats itself. So this is how I can find the output signal for some input signal using Fourier series and the knowledge about the eigenvalues of my systems and the differential equation. This is the last problem that I want to show you. I have a system and this system has this frequency characteristic. This is the magnitude and this is the phase of this frequency characteristic. Now the input of this system is this signal. My question is, what will be the output of the system? Again, I do not care about the initial conditions. I assume that this system is operating from time minus infinity and I'm just looking at that steady state. So how do I find out the output for this input? Well, I need to realize that this is just a linear combination of sines and cosines. Even this constant is just a cosine at zero frequency. And now that I know that these are just sines and cosines, how do I find the output for this input? Well, individually. 
I will realize that when I have this cosine, its frequency is 4 radians per second. So at the output of my system, this cosine will create the same cosine, except it will be multiplied by the frequency characteristic, by the magnitude of the frequency characteristic at this frequency, and it will be phase shifted by the frequency characteristic, by the phase of the frequency characteristic at this frequency. Then this sign that will create at the output the same sign except it will be multiplied by the magnitude of the frequency characteristic at the frequency of that sign and it will be phase shifted by the phase of the frequency characteristic at the frequency of this sign. Last, this constant, as I told you, this is just a cosine at zero frequency. And this is even simplified by the fact that when this frequency is zero, this frequency characteristic is just a real number. So its magnitude is equal to the frequency characteristic itself and its phase is zero. So this constant is just multiplied by the frequency characteristic at frequency zero. And this is what I get at the output. So if this is the input, this will be my output. And when I substitute for these individual frequency characteristics at those specific frequencies, I will get this.